Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived at the concluding session and grand finale of the first International Conservative Congress and a hugely informative and inspiriting weekend it has been. After several important preliminaries, we will be addressed by Newt Gingrich, William F. Buckley Jr., and Lady Thatcher. We may say without the least hyperbole that these three have done more by their thoughts, words, and deeds to advance the conservative movement to its current position of preeminence than any others now living with the single and singular exception of Ronald Reagan himself. <laughs> Our admiration for them is inexpressible and we are immensely privileged to share this moment with them. Gratitude is due many for the success of this Congress, but I wish to recognize and convey particular heartfelt thanks to two supremely competent and lovely women who have managed all of our arrangements from the inception and surmounted all of the usual obstacles and many crises along the way with serenity and aplomb, Dorothy McCartney of National Review and Isabel Ferguson of AEI. I also extend special thanks to Christy Schneider of AEI and David Frum of the Weekly Standard and salute the dozens of staff members and interns from AEI and the Heritage Foundation and the many student volunteers from Claremont McKenna University, the Ashbrook Center for Public Affairs, Syracuse, UC Santa Cruz, and several Washington area universities who have thrown themselves into the organizational fray with terrific energy these past few days. Last and foremost, the indefatigable John O'Sullivan, who, John conceived of this Congress, has served throughout as its inspiration, impresario, publicist, and shepherd of diverse and deservedly large egos and in the end has graciously shared the marquee with four public policy institutes that he dragooned, excuse me, recruited to support his efforts. Chairman O'Sullivan, we, unlike William Weld, will kiss your ring any old time. <laughs> The organizers of the conference have prepared a statement of conservative principles intended to set forth several fundamentals of conservative thinking at this moment in our movement and our nation's politics. It is not quite the 30 seconds of poetry recommended to us yesterday by Congressman Talent, and it may seem a rather pale reflection of the extraordinarily deep and vigorous presentations made throughout this Congress, but it is pithy and pointed it has been discussed by the delegates in the course of our deliberations, and it has been improved in a few important respects, not as much as some would like, but in important respects, and in ways that I believe will attract and have attracted a general approval among us. Pronouncements of this sort tend to acquire the names of the places of their issuance, Sharon, Port Huron, the Tamworth Manifesto, if our Congress turns out to be as significant as we hope, our declaration may come in time to be called the Second Mayflower Compact. <laughs> it now stands in the lobby for your inspection, accumulating signatures and awaiting more. I would like to call for the statement's adoption by general acclamation. I want to emphasize that no one is being asked to subscribe to every jot and tittle, but only to the general spirit of the thing. Particular conditions, qualifications, codicils, partial concurrences, dissents are not only welcome but strongly encouraged to be submitted to the Congress's organizers for publication 
with the statement and with other worthy fragments of our discussions. With that spirit in mind and reminding one and all that the whole world is watching through the lenses of the liberal international media, <coughs> I call for the statement's adoption. May I first hear the ayes for adoption? Aye. 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 And now the nays for rejection. We have a few nattering nabobs <laughs> of negativism here. The chair declares the statement adopted by acclamation in a free and fair vote. Mr. Speaker, is it really this easy up in your Congress? I encourage all who wish to sign it on the, at the conclusion of this session. Finally, I would like to invite all of the delegates to join Lady Thatcher, Dick Army, and me for the AEI reception at 4 p.m. today in the Cannon Caucus Room on Capitol Hill, where we'll, we will be unveiling the two new historical portraits of Presidents Ford and Reagan and their peers. I have myself just seen the photographs of the astonishing 12-foot portrait of President Reagan and Prime Minister Thatcher and promise that all who attend will be stirred and edified as well as well-fed and lubricated. <laughs> Buses will be departing from the side to sales a street entrance of the hotel at 3.30, 3.45. Uh, we may have a van later for stragglers and returning from the Cannon House office building uh, beginning at uh, 5.30, 5.45. It is now my pleasure to introduce T. Kenneth Cribb, Jr., President of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute and publisher of the Intercollegiate Review and Campus. Ken served with great distinction and effectiveness in the Ronald Reagan White House and the Edwin Meese Justice Department. He is one of the most energetic and is certainly the cheeriest of all the generals of the conservative army, now carrying the battle into the heart of hostile territory on our nation's campuses. I call upon Ken for his remarks and the presentation of the Thatcher Prize. Thank you very much, Chris. This year we commemorate the bicentenary of Edmund Burke, who at the moment of his most bitter parliamentary defeat still had the confidence in the young to say, I attest the rising generation. Burke knew very well that the future of what were then called the chartered rights of Englishmen depended wholly on the character and quality of the young minds enlisted in their defense. And just so with the post-World War II revival of conservative thought, which owed so much to the circumstance that our seminal intellectuals of that period, working through mediating institutions, took great care to prepare the minds of the next generation. Bill Buckley was with us today, was in the thick of that as the first president of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute and the founder of National Review in that era. In those days, it was more a felt duty than a tactic, but it has worked most wondrously. And whatever the prospects of um, modern conservatism as a political entity in the next months or the next weeks, we all know from the vineyards that we till that each year more and more young people swell our ranks. And they were in part attracted to our position uh, because we affirm the wisdom and the learning that over 3,000 years grew to greatness uh, from Jerusalem to Athens to Rome to London and then to our own shores. And so these young conservatives are precisely those students who engage in a serious study of the great books and the great ideas. Their minds are not stunted by the limits of their own experience but are enlarged and enlivened by the collective experience of Aristotle and Aquinas and the great Burke himself. And in ways that we cannot now predict, these young people will make their marks in many venues to help shore up the foundations of our common life. We know this because it has been a continuous and growing phenomenon since the mid-50s. With this in mind, uh, John O'Sullivan and I de decided that as familiar as our young scholars are with the achievement of Ronald Reagan, it would be a good thing to encourage on this side of the Atlantic a more detailed consideration of the ideas and achievement of his principal ally in the defeat of communism and the revival of free institutions in the West. And of course, I speak of Margaret Thatcher. And for those around Reagan, it was impossible to mistake the great store that he placed 
and as he put it, having Maggie on his side. So last winter, we utilized the resources of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute to launch an essay contest for undergraduate and graduate students here in America uh, and in the Western Hemisphere. We have a Canadian winner. We even have a British subject who was attending Boston uh, College. But we invited them to expound on the principles of Thatcherism to assess Lady Thatcher's legacy and its prospects in the new millennium. Six uh, distinguished scholars and public policy experts consented to judge the contest. George Carey of Georgetown, Edwin Fulner of the Heritage Foundation, Robert George of Princeton University, Robin Harris of the Thatcher Foundation, Forrest McDonald of the University of Alabama, and Walter Williams of George Mason University. These are hard, these are hard judges. Word on the contest was sent out through ISI's own uh, 62,000 uh, members, uh, students and professors, in our own journals, uh, in a network of 60 independent newspapers that we administer. Uh, substantial cash prizes were awarded and, uh, to, the, to the six winners and uh, libraries of conservative thought uh, to the runners-up, but I have an idea that the in most enticing incentive was for the winners to be present today and to meet Lady Thatcher in person. Hundreds of applicants received her two-volume autobiography, The Downing Street Years and the Path to Power, for research. Of the entries, over 200 were of scholarly quality, and of those, the best was set on to the independent panel of judges. The, the winning essays will be published in National Review and in the Intercollegiate Review, and other winners will be offered to other publications. Now, what did this new generation of young scholars conclude? The essays with us today, and you will meet them shortly, find the root of Thatcherism, as it's called, to be a recognition that our patrimony of freedom is a fragile inheritance and one that is neglected at our peril. Lady Thatcher, in her own writings, is painfully cognizant that the freedoms so lately on the mend in the great world will not be maintained in perpetuity without renewing the centuries-old struggle for liberty in which our own country has played the leading role. Thus the dynamism at the core of Lady Fashion's vision is passionate, thoughtful, yet plain-spoken appeal for the renewal of our basic commitment to the rule of law, to individual liberty, and to justice. So faced with the uh, miserable failure of Britain's prolonged experiment with uh, socialism and with the Tory party bereft of imagination, Lady Thatcher set out to revive a tradition of ordered liberty that, as our essayists point out, had its antecedents in Burke and Smith and Macaulay, Tocqueville, Disraeli, and our own time, uh, Friedman, Novak, and Hayek. To a large extent, Margaret Thatcher bequeathed to us as working policies what she herself inherited from the conservative intellectual tradition. This vision, which in our time has come to be known as Thatcherism, is defined, as one of our essays put it, macroeconomic stability through monetarism, free markets, limited government interfer interference, a social fabric strengthened by personal responsibility, and a strong internationalism through resisting aggression and promoting national sovereignty. Each of the winners found it remarkable that seven years after Lady Thatcher left office, countries over the world strained under the weight of statism uh, seek out her own model for relief. Perhaps momentarily sharing in this surprise, uh, Lady Thatcher herself once remarked, I suppose the policy I introduced became an ism, Thatcherism. And it's rather strange to have given birth to an ism. You know, I was used to giving birth to twins. <laughs> Our essayists assess that the, the impact of that Thatcher legacy in some detail. It's a story that, that, that members of this audience are familiar with. A story of renewing freedom and the prosperity that came from that at home. A story of standing up for freedom against its recent enemies in the totalitarian East. But what struck these young scholars most, living as they do in the morally chaotic world of the university, is her absolute refusal to compromise core principles. And they learn 
that an unwillingness to substitute consensus for leadership can indeed pay off in very practical ways. That political success need not depend on mere expediency. As she herself put it, what great cause would have been fought and won under the banner, I stand for consensus. And so today's young adults see the phenomenal success of, of Lady Thatcher's te tenure at Downing Street as a sharp rebuttal to those cynics who are always with us and who see the world as reflections of their own cynicism. They are defeated, if not silenced, by the historical record of Margaret Thatcher, where she made a mockery of those who mock and showed a jaded world the fruits of steadfastness in the face of unrelenting assault. She has demonstrated that no one need fear the self-proclaimed elites of our day, whatever their power, wherever their presence. We are told that history is made by impersonal forces beyond our control, that is naive to believe that one person can alter the course of a nation's history. Today, these young people know this to be false, for they can see for themselves, without the filter of ideology, that one woman did change her nation for the better, even as she has provided the world with a proof that freedom works. As one essayist put it, when in search of a model and method for unleashing prosperity and securing freedom through virtue, one need look no further than the government of the grocer's daughter. What will history say? Well, the playwright uh, has General Burgoyne reply, history, sir, will tell lies as usual. Well, not if these young scholars have anything to say about it. And they have already begun to speak. They speak of a woman who had the temerity to assert to a generation of defeatists that the world could be at peace and on Western terms. They speak of a woman who, by reducing the scope of the nanny state, enlarged the scope of the individual conscience and of the human heart. Like Burke before her, Lady Thatcher attests the rising generation. Her testimony is manifest in the deeds she has done, the words she has written, and the life she has lived. Today, all of us stand witness as she will extend her hand to the best of the new generation, secure in the belief that they themselves will offer their own hands to those who follow. Lady Thatcher, if you could join us here. call up the winners uh, one by one to, uh, be, to greet Mrs. Thatcher and receive their awards. Timothy J. Lynch, Nathaniel Davis, Jeffrey C. O'Brien, Raymond J. D'Souza, no relation. <laughs> Jeremy M. Beer. Travis Hopp. And now the first place winner and the recipient of the Thatcher Prize, an ISI graduate fellow at uh, Indiana University, Mr. Kevin Saylor. Thank you very much, Lady Thatcher. Mr. Chairman, I return the podium.
It is an honor now to recognize the gentleman from the 6th District of Georgia, the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Newt Gingrich. Mr. Gingrich was unequivocally lionized by conservatives until he became the head lion and constitutionally charged with speaking for a very large and rambunctious pride. Since then, he has now and then been criticized by conservatives, and it is reported that he has sometimes received these criticisms with less than complete magnanimous detachment. <laughs> Let it be said that he understands, as no one else does, what it is like to work at the center of a constitutional structure painstakingly designed by the founders to make it entirely impossible to accomplish anything at all expeditiously or unambiguously. Let it be said also that his impatience with our impatience is a sure sign that he continues to regard himself as one of us, as we continue to regard him, and as he truly is. Please give a warm welcome to Speaker Newt Gingrich. Thank you all very, very much, and thank you, Chris. Uh, I thought that was rather accurately put, and I uh, am proud to be here today with two other people who are quite cheerful, I think, about on occasion responding vigorously when they disagree with those who disagree. So I think, uh, in that sense, the three of us represent a rather strong personality approach to defining conservatism's future. You know, it's a particular honor to me to be here because this particular gathering much like the gathering four years ago, brings together an amazing number of people of all sorts of backgrounds, vigorously committed to talking out and thinking through where conservatism needs to go. And I really believe that much of the launching point for the contract with America and the success of 1994 was right in this room four years ago at a very similar conference. My dear friend Gay Gaines here uh, organized, and I think that the ideas we took from that day and the courage we took from getting together from all over America and around the world and realizing that conservatism matters gave us a renewed sense of vigor in going to the country with a clear, bold message in 1994. In a sense, all of us are honored because we stand on the shoulders of Bill Buckley, of Ronald Reagan, and of Lady Thatcher. I think it's very important, I, I read the agenda and I was a little distressed by the opening phases of it, which struck me as uh, far too defeatist. As a historian, I would remind those of you who are younger and those of you who are my age would have forgotten that in 1977, with Carter and Callahan, with the Soviet Empire on offense, there were grounds to be genuinely worried about the survival of the West. Today, there are grounds to worry about how well some chameleons of the left will pretend to be us, but there are few grounds to worry in the short run about the survival of the West. That is, I think, an enormously better base within which to talk about the expansion of freedom, which should be the hallmark of the conservative movement. If you go back to that period and you ask what succeeded, why, why did you have first with Lady Thatcher and then shortly thereafter with Ronald Reagan, this enormous breakthrough of principles that are very old and traditional, but which were very new and modern in their articulation, I would argue that there were a couple of key factors. The first was that principles mattered more than personality. We tend to forget, but both Lady Thatcher and President Reagan were much less regarded in the coming than they were after they had been there. That in the period of their initial assertion of these beliefs, they were seen as radicals, as threats, as dangerous, as pugnacious personalities. And while Lady Thatcher at times came across as a school teacher teaching her nation and the world. Ronald Reagan was roundly criticized for the term evil empire, and it was only when Gorbachev himself said later it was actually quite useful since they had wondered uh, whether we knew it was evil, and once we said it was, they decided to agree. Uh, <laughs> a point of view the New York Times has ever quite caught up with. Uh, the fact is that strong personalities focusing on devoutly held principles were more important than charismatic leadership in the way it is normally meant in our media. In addition, the tradition that Bill Buckley, 
and President Reagan and Lady Thatcher launched was one of making clear, vivid differences with the left. Now, I want to start by focusing on what I think does make us unique, and that is that this is in many ways an Anglo-American conservative movement in its intellectual origins. The gap between the United States and Britain across the Atlantic is infinitely smaller than the gap between Britain and the continent across the channel in historic terms. And the reason is very profound. The reason is very profound, and this is an intellectual point we need to drive home across the planet. True conservatism in the modern form starts with the Magna Carta, which we are honored to have a copy of uh, in the Great Rotunda of the United States Capitol. It, go, it comes down through the English Civil War and the assertion that individuals have the right to approach God outside a hierarchy and then is codified by John Locke, picked up by Jefferson and the Founding Fathers, enters into the Declaration of Independence with the statement that we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, which is why the difference in the two models is so radical. In the Anglo-American model, power comes from God to the citizen and is loaned to the state. In the European model, power comes from God to the king and is loaned to the citizen. There is a very basic difference in the origin of the two systems, which is why in our Constitution we begin, we the people. And so we need to go out, I think, across the planet, go out across our own country, and say these core principles matter. That human freedom is a matter of endowment by God, and that we have, therefore, a genuine mission to see that every human has the right to pursue happiness, which is a term used by Lord Hume, a Scottish philosopher of the 18th century, underlined by Jefferson in his own library, and which referred, in Lord Hume's version, to the pursuit of virtue and morality. He said true happiness is, therefore, the pursuit of virtue and morality, and it was that sense in which Jefferson used that phrase rather than Locke's pursuit of property. Now, when the Soviet empire collapsed, because conservatism had defined itself as anti-communist, there has been a long pause. We moved from those who vividly described the bold principles to those who frankly weren't confident enough to debate on principle. And that happened across, I think, the Western world. At the same time, the modern left figured out that if they did not imitate us, they couldn't win. And regarding victory as more important than principle, they promptly across the West learned our language. So you have the French socialists running against tax increases and offering tax cuts. You have Tony Blair running essentially as closer to Lady Thatcher than his conservative opponent. And you have Bill Clinton, who of course was in favor of welfare reform, middle class tax cuts, believed the era of big government was over, and everything else necessary to get good poll ratings as long as he didn't have to actually appoint people who believed them. Now, in that framework, we in the conservative movement, I think, have gone through a little period of being confused. We regain clarity with the contract with America, and then because of the turmoil and confusion of our constitutional system, we had a, a certain period of, of confusion trying to communicate what we were doing. At the same time, I would commend to all of you the introduction to this year's Almanac of American Politics by Michael Barone, which I think is the most accurate statement of where we are and what has happened. And Barone makes the point that across the entire modern world, the news media is consistently on the left, which means that between campaigns, facts are framed on the left, debates are framed on the left, and the bias is so deep that those who are biased don't even know that they're biased because all of their friends share the same view, and they therefore think it is simply normal to talk in a left-wing worldview. What that does is it keeps conservatism tactically on the defensive because you know that every news show you go into, every press conference you go into, every editorial you read will start so far to the left that unless you have enormous focus of purpose, it is very hard to communicate through the clutter. And Barone captures that better than anybody I've read so far. However, this is my proposition and why I was so thrilled to be invited to come today and have a chance to be with Lady Thatcher and with Bill Buckley. We can regain momentum and communicate despite the elite media, by a cheerful, enthusiastic focus on clear, vivid differences. 
And I think that has to be our hallmark for 98, for 99, and for 2000. And I believe if we focus on defining accurately and enthusiastically the clear, vivid differences, that we will, in fact, have a remarkable impact. I want to give you a few policies that will define our future on terms that both fit the future and fit our philosophy and appeal to the American people. I think all three are necessary. Every generation has to apply a new ancient principles to current realities. I think our realities are three. It's a triangle. One side of it's the information age, which opens up enormous potential and some risks. The second side is the world market, which will dramatically enhance the prosperity of the entire human race, but also means we have to really think about how to compete. And the third side is American culture and the American constitutional structure. I believe in that triangle, conservatism can communicate vividly and decisively a better future for most Americans in terms they can understand. Because you're going to have the opportunity to hear from both Lady Thatcher and Bill Buckley, I'm going to say this in very stark, simple terms, and I'm going to try to give you just a couple of sentences on seven key areas. But I believe if we are calm and comfortable and enthusiastic and repetitive, we will be shocked at how much we communicate. The first is taxes. And our position there should be very simple. We want tax reform sufficiently thorough that we can abolish the IRS as we know it, period. And we want it now. We will be proposing a dialogue with the American people so that literally starting in November and December of this year, through the period when they're doing their taxes in the first three months of next year, they can decide as they file what would be better than the mess we're trapped in. And I would hope that by um, May or June, we will have introduced a dramatic, bold tax reform bill that would allow us to do two great things in addition to saving time for the American people. It would allow us to dramatically shrink the Internal Revenue Service, uh, which now has 110,000 people. And it would allow us to dramatically shrink the number of lobbyists on 14th Street, because the fact is, if there are no loopholes, there are no lobbyists, or at least the number declines dramatically. And I think that when you get to a very simple, very clear tax code, you will have accomplished a great deal for this country and begun to move power back to the people rather than having it locked up in various committees of the Treasury, the IRS, and the Congress. Second, we should state firmly and clearly that since we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, it is clearly, totally wrong for the government of the United States to discriminate against any American citizen, and we are opposed to any quotas or any set-asides which allow the government to decide who wins. We will next spring move the Kennedy legislation, which provides for civil rights equality for all Americans. And in the interim, I hope we will have hearings and meetings across the country so that people who have been discriminated against can appear in the local media, can appear in local ses settings, can be communicating that, in fact, injustice is done every month in this country when the federal government intervenes to decide who the winners and losers are based upon quotas and set-asides. Third, we should have affirmative outreach. And the place where I think the conservative movement will have its greatest impact is reaching out in education. Our goal should be simple. We want every child to be so well educated that they can pursue happiness without needing a quota or a set aside. If the answer, if a group is not getting enough people well enough educated to get into law school, the answer is to reform the local school, not to set up an artificial quota. We can afford to say that. We start by saying education is preeminently local. It is local parents, local children, and local teachers creating a local opportunity. We will have a bill which moves 90% of all federal funding to the local community, eliminating the federal bureaucracy and getting the money back home where it belongs. In addition, we need to focus on the basics, on discipline, and on safety. Children should go to schools that are safe. They should go to schools where there is an expectation that there will be discipline where they will learn the basics, and let me say quite simple, every child in America should be able to read and write by the end of the third grade, and that means read and write in English because that is the language of opportunity for the American people.
When a system fails to reform itself, parents should have the right to take their children and send them to a school that is safe, disciplined, and has learning occur. And everywhere in America, where we're offering poor parents in the inner city an opportunity, they are taking it. In Ohio, where Governor Voinovich passed a scholarship program, there are 2,500 children in scholarships already in Cleveland and 4,500 on the waiting list. Let the left explain why their unions matter more than the children. Let us focus on the children and the parents and the right to be educated so in the information age you have the tools. And finally, on education, we should pass the Coverdell Education Savings Account so every parent and every community has the right and the ability to save money for their children and send the signal again that we want to encourage parents to focus on their children's education. Fourth, we should re-emphasize vividly the need to defend freedom and the fact that history has not ended and that safety has not arrived. I would suggest to you that we have had a disastrous week in Russia. Look at the, I would say, of the Clinton administration's recent trip to Russia, to paraphrase Caesar, they came, they saw, they surrendered. And they surrendered on two fronts. The anti-religious liberty bill being signed by the, by the Yeltsin administration is abhorrent to the principle of religious liberty and of personal freedom and is a large step back towards state autocracy. And it would have been better, frankly, for the vice president not to have gone, rather than to have gone feebly protested and then done nothing. But second, every conservative who knows the lessons of history should be outraged that this administration is giving up the ability to defend America and giving up the ability to defend our allies and our troops by signing away the scientific and technological capabilities of the West in return for a paper agreement from a weak regime which cannot possibly keep its word and an agreement which has nothing to do with Iran, nothing to do with North Korea, nothing to do with China, nothing to do with Iraq. And it is totally wrong. It is as if Stanley Baldwin had signed an agreement with the Germans not to build radar. It is totally wrong. And we should insist on a simple principle that America will lead the world and that requires the leading military and that our young men and women and our cities and civilians deserve the best defense that science and technology can create, not the weakest defense. Fifth, we need to establish a sound, personal pension system for the baby boomers and their children. We should start by studying Chile. This will take several years, but we should make it clear. We believe it is possible for people to have a retirement program they can count on, a retirement program they can manage, and a retirement program that is far more stable and safe than allowing bureaucrats to control your lives. And I believe that is a dialogue we will win if we have the moral courage to pursue it in a regular way. Sixth, and this one may strike you as a little odd the way I initially describe it. I believe conservatives should insist on the rule of law. What we have witnessed in the last two years is the largest systematic violation of the rule of law I, can, I understand as a historian in American presidential campaign history. We have seen non-citizens vote. We believe in some places in California in large enough numbers to change elections. We have seen people made citizens illegally so that some 85,000 convicted felons became citizens because the, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, under pressure from the Clinton-Gore administration, broke the law and failed to engage in the FBI background checks. We have seen foreigners invited into America, invited into the White House on a grand scale for illegal contributions of illegal money. We have seen a government official visiting the Chinese embassy numerous times, and we saw the Attorney General forget to call the National Security Advisor to tell him she had information the Chinese were trying to influence the American election. We have seen illegal money laundering on a grand scale, and we have seen illegal fundraising on federal property, including a shameful 
unimaginable use of the Lincoln bedroom. And all of this is trivialized. All of this becomes a series of amusing stories, of cartoons. The truth is simple. Sometime after the 1994 election, a relatively small number of people on the left came to the conclusion that they could not survive if they obeyed the law. And they decided that political victory was worth the risk because through obstruction of justice, stonewalling, and their alliance with the, with the cultural elite, they would simply survive no matter what. And as a result, from the Teamsters, to Citizens Action, to the Democratic National Committee, to the Clinton-Gore campaign, to the White House itself, the very process of constitutional law was undermined in an ongoing manner. And to this day, those who have sworn to uphold the Constitution are acting like defendants in chief rather than commander in chief, and they are using their lawyers and they are using their staffs to block the pursuit of truth and to block the enforcement of the law. Now, does any serious person truly believe that if the law can be broken on this scale and nothing is done, that passing new laws will fix things? We have already have a Democrat running in California promising to spend $30 million of his personal fortune. He's worth an estimated $500 million, so if he gets truly excited during the campaign, he may double or triple that. Does anyone believe that if, if this team, having broken this many laws, manages to avoid the truth, that every consultant in the country isn't going to start saying you might as well break the law because it doesn't matter? And our entire system will melt down. So we should say something very simple. This is a nation of laws, not personalities. And the rule of law is paramount in the American system. And we insist that the law be enforced and that lawbreakers be found and be punished, period. End of debate. <laughs> Finally, it is time for conservatives to take up the cause of true campaign reform to have honest, fair elections. And we need to say it straight out. We stand for free speech. We stand for the right of Americans to have free speech. And we stand for the right of Americans to contribute honestly and directly in order to have free speech. We have three bills we'd like to pass that I think would begin to change the system. The first is John Doolittle's bill, which says no PACs, no soft money, no labor union money, but you can give unlimited after-tax personal money filed every night on the internet so we know who gave and who supports who. But you don't have the spectacle of a millionaire in California buying the governorship for 30 million bucks personally while citizens are restricted to $500. <laughs> Second, Congressman Schaefer has a bill modeled on the Washington State Initiative which says that no union member can be coerced into giving money. They must sign written approval for the union to take political money out of their paycheck. It got 73% of the vote in Washington state. And as proof that this is coerced money, there's one union local which had 3.2% of its members sign the approval. 96.8% refused to give any money. And I think it's time that we said on behalf of the workers of America, we will give you the right to decide whether or not you want to give money to those who currently claim to speak for you. <laughs> finally, finally, we have a bill introduced by Congressman Steve Horn, which is quite simple. It says you have to be an American citizen to vote in an American election. And we're allowed to ask whether or not you're a citizen if we're not sure, which is currently illegal in California. Now, I think we ought to make it very straightforward. We are for political reform that increases freedom, that increases participation, that increases the chance to defeat incumbents. Our opponents want more bureaucratic politics on top of the bureaucratic reforms that have failed. They have learned none of the lessons of the last two years, and they would restrict political freedom and restrict right of free speech, and we think that is constitutionally wrong and a violation of the Bill of Rights. And we stand with the Founding Fathers and the right of every citizen to be able to have political free speech.
It is, I think if we are willing to calmly and enthusiastically and persistently advocate those kind of bold differences, we will be very pleased with the scale of our majorities and with the size of the American people who move to our side and who decide that we represent a better future for themselves, their children, and their country. And I think that, frankly, is our calling. And I'm going to introduce two wonderful people. And as one theme, I guess I'd like to leave with you as you listen to them. Not only are they wise, not only have they been very, very important to the future of the human race, but think about what all each of them endured in order to get to be here today. I was really struck with this because Lady Thatcher was commenting to me earlier about how much we all owe Bill Buckley, about how long he was a lonely voice, how long there was, first of all, no Goldwater until Goldwater read Buckley. And then Goldwater and Buckley read each other, and suddenly there was a national movement. <laughs> and then Reagan listened to Goldwater, watched Buckley, read National Review, and suddenly we had a presidency. <laughs> and through that whole period, for long stretches, he was the only voice on television who had a clue what conservatism was. Or maybe I should say the only one who had a clue and got it right. And so let me, let me just ask as you listen to each of these, that you think about what they've done and that for our generation and for our children's generation, that we find folks who have the same level of courage, the same cheerful willingness to engage, the same enthusiastic energy devoted to freedom. And let me ask you first to join me in asking here to the podium, the man on whose pen and whose voice the conservative movement grew, the man whose mind shaped far more of the last 40 years than any liberal would have believed possible in 1955 when he began this great journey. The man whom we all look to as the great teacher of American conservatism, William F. Buckley. Thank you very much, uh, Lady Thatcher, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Knuth, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we, we are satisfied after two days that there are visions out there, some of them realized, some of them uh, escaping, some escape, some gestating and fitful. Uh, my generation was fired by a threat at once uh, strategic and philosophical. <clears throat> Joseph uh, Stalin was never easy for American fellow travelers to uh, uh, handle, though some attempted it and even found themselves defending the coup in Czechoslovakia in 1948. But it wasn't until Vietnam that the confusion became full-throated, especially in the academy. It was then, beginning in 1968, that Ho Chi Minh was likened to George Washington. Uh, the line blurred on why we should not persist in Vietnam. Uh, our action there was deplored by reasonable critics on tactical and strategic grounds and application of geopolitical prudence. But that uh, opposition to the war uh, became in many quarters first a fatalistic benediction of the communist enterprise, finally an enthusiastic endorsement of it. Ho, 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 Ho Chi Minh is bound to win. Uh, drawing deeply from the antinomianism of the 1960s, uh, some Americans opined that there was no distinction between us and them. Indeed, that if we labored to parse the question, we'd draw back embarrassed by our materialism, uh, apprehended by history in a subordinate position on the idealistic ladder of politics. It was a time when serious derangement uh, threatened, when some of our proudest universities uh, gave over to mindless young philosophical terrorists control of the campus and over the protocols of democratic uh, life. 
<clears throat> that ended, though not in clear victory by the right-minded, uh, the war's end finessed any moral resolution on the larger the theater by and large we held fast. We can take pride in our steadfastness between 1945 and 1991, but there is here a lesson and its implications should be with us always, especially as we find ourselves fretful as so many yesterday and today expressed themselves as being. Cato Byrne wondered at lunch uh, whether conservatives were expected to do nothing more than merely celebrate the tenure of the new Congress. The speaker has made it obvious that this is not in prospect. Uh, at a gathering of the faithful in 1990, I remarked that I was 19 years old when the Cold War was ignited in Yalta, and that the year the Berlin Wall came down, I became a senior citizen. Thus, the Cold War lasted throughout my adult lifetime, which meant that tens of millions lived their adult lifetimes in the bitter, seemingly endless cold of tyranny. The lessons are two. <clears throat> the first, the great uh, strategic, strategic ends can take generations to realize. The second, that at least some element of impatience is owed to ideals envisioned and realizable. A difficulty of American conservatives at this moment is that we are without a harnessing bias, which the Cold War gave us, and we are not completely comfortable with the metaphysics of democratic uh, order. If our vision is unencumbered by conscientious qualifications or skepticism, then why can't we march forward? We did this a generation ago in the matter of civil rights. <clears throat> the vision of protection for Americans of all races was to be so encumbered. There were those who saw and were deterred by constitutional reservations, which retrospectively we demote to constitutional niceties. No other grand vision can be said to have been realized in the succeeding generation, not the elimination of poverty, not the universalization of literacy, not, I think, a tolerable subjugation of government. Having said this, I vote <clears throat> with those of you who believe our objective is made more difficult by injections of fantasy, the dream of the blessings of statelessness. It is great sport to mock the state categorically, and I have in my lifetime engaged happily in ideological slapstick as when licentiously quoting H. L. Mencken's bracing law that the state, of, the state is the enemy of all well-disposed, decent, and industrious men. Fun but untrue. The sounding board of reason and experience harmonizes better with Jefferson's taunt that the state can't do anything for the people except in proportion as it can do something to the people. There is in Jefferson's formulation the leaven of contingency that enlivens with realism but is otherwise merely a cheerleader's incantation. <clears throat> the idea of abolishing the state is properly reserved for meditation in cloisters of ideological fundamentalism. The proper challenge of conservatives is to tame the state. And the question we most appropriately ask is what is the proper tempo for such an enterprise and if the tempo we wish for it is incompatible with democratic practice, even as the liberation of Europe was for many years held to be incompatible with peaceful coexistence, at uh, what point should impatience prevail over democratic uh, docility? The aging prisoner of the Soviet Union, who after 40 years of waiting, rebuked Western leadership, as Solzhenitsyn did, as preoccupied with avoiding military risk, wins not only our sympathy, but our contingent uh, understanding. <clears throat> what uh, satisfactions are we entitled to take from the vision itself? Mr. Krauthammer told us yesterday we might try depoliticizing our perspectives. The Christian uh, knows the rules of the game. Worldly approaches to the Christian vision are in the nature of things asymptotic. We can aspire to the goodness of Mother Teresa, but the realization 
of goodness is for another world. Meanwhile, secular metabolism quickens the appetite for the achievement of such earthly ends as Newt Gingrich just specified. Any confusion between the two visions runs the risk identified by Eric Vogelin, which he warned when he warned against immunitizing the eschaton. History uh, teaches us, or rather fails to teach us, that political visions are slow to reify. Uh, as the American slaves would learn, <clears throat> and indeed American women, on the long road to the voting booth, much of what uh, most American conservatives want can't be as niftily executed as the ratification of the 21st Amendment. Much of what we want is illusory. How much of what we want is properly illusory? Perhaps the problem was explored uh, in a seminar I didn't attend. But uh, none that I did was emphasis placed on the besetting problem of illegitimacy. It is certainly illusory to suppose the problem can be erased, but surely not that the problem can't be reduced and that American conservatives are best endowed to confront it. Uh, is it time to review the sanctions that might be used to make progress toward that much that we seek that is not illusory. But ten years ago, outraged by American life, George Kennan went so far as to <coughs> ask <coughs> whether we had anything to teach the Soviet Union. <coughs> in America, he said, we were making no progress in removing our slums, in eliminating poverty, in containing pornography, restoring civility, nurturing the environment, reducing crime, or raising the level of literacy. Uh, Mr. Cannon was driven to ask in 1987, why do U.S. Uh, leaders speak condescendingly to their counterparts in Moscow? This isn't an occasion to rub the nose of a gifted and industrious scholar. In the differences between the Soviet life, as described, say, by Solzhenitsyn, and life in the United States described by whomever, Still, it is true that we suffer the blights he enumerates and the illegitimacy rate in which so many other concerns are subsumed uh, is in apparent freefall. What can conservatives contribute to, to alleviating a problem that generates a 600% high incidence among children raised by a single parent of crime, poverty, illiteracy, and drug addiction? But Charles Murray argues persuasively against uh, paying welfare benefits to unwed mothers with children, but doesn't really convince us, forgive me, Charles, that to do so would mean an end to the fruit of unguarded sexual promiscuity. One wonders, are we suffering from a failure of nerve? The gravamen of the liberals' case against America has always had to do with the free market's disposition to let people make out on their own. We are preached to and cajoled and thundered at on what care we must take for those who, do, who choose not to learn to read and write or to refuse drugs or to resist a criminal temptation or libertine sex. It is a special responsibility of conservatives to adopt correlative attitudes toward failures of a certain character. Elizabeth Taylor has dispensed with her eighth husband we would have no reason to be surprised if tomorrow she married her ninth. Or to be surprised if that union were treated other than as one more glamorous event. Photographers from People magazine are floating down in parachutes to capture the moment. But that has to be an, there has to be an effect on the thinking and attitudes and indeed behavior of some whose values are unformed or are in flux of the serial marriages of the most durably glamorous woman uh, in America. If imitation is the highest form of flattery, might it be said that uh, though Miss Taylor has had only eight husbands, she has given birth to millions of children. <laughs> we are free to outlaw disruptive behavior, but most uh, sanctions are happily less than incarceration. What are these? And when and how is it appropriate to level them? 
and how might they be marshaled to make the public case against the indiscriminate births. When Bill Clinton was governor of Arkansas, <clears throat> he proposed denying a driver's license to any 16-year-old who wasn't attending school. Examine the whole matter of sanctions. What favor do we confer on the student who, even though he has no learning disability, refuses to learn to read? 70% of American homeless are, we learn, drug addicts or alcoholics. Do we really help them with comprehensive shelter? Why are we so determined to understand uh, those whose behavior is antisocial, whether sowing disruption in classrooms or seeds of life in lackadaisical engagements, however passionate? A good society needs to be hospitable to virtue, which is the easy part, but shouldn't it also be inhospitable to dereliction? It is for another forum, perhaps the second international conservative congress to explore suitable rewards and acceptable tribulations. Let's leave it that as long as the behavior of Elizabeth Taylor merely amuses, <clears throat> we cannot or are unwilling to generate a stigma. A man who fathers the child whom he proceeds to ignore is a second class citizen. How should we discourage second-class behavior? Isn't this a fruitful concern <clears throat> of conservatives whose stake is so large <clears throat> in the preservation of the family and in the diminution of activity by the state? Uh, Mr. Speaker, however illusory some of our most extravagant dreams, we do take pleasure, <clears throat> mostly though not all of it wholesome, from choice historical episodes, when providence seems to smile down on us. <clears throat> One such <clears throat> was the great social and economic validations Mrs. Thatcher midwifed for us. As a boy, I remember wondering what exactly it was that Mr. Jefferson had in mind when he spoke of our rights as including the pursuit of happiness. What I wondered was the nature of what we were pursuing. In the rivers in California, the prospectors sought gold, a readily identifiable substance. The pursuit of it was or was not successful, <clears throat> even as you did or did not find oil after drilling that hole. I know now that it is the pursuit itself that brings our happiness, which is why in our own way, for some of us obsessive, for others secondary or even lackadaisical, we pursue that uh, deliquescent happiness. <clears throat> happiness can be very concrete, like electing Ronald Reagan or turning Congress over to Newt Gingrich. Uh, what uh, first intimidates and then frightens <clears throat> is the prospect of <clears throat> pursuit deflected or profaned or become counterfeit. Where the objective is absolutely tangible, one's progress can be reliably tabulated if my objective is to count the number of people I have persuaded to cast their ballots for Margaret Thatcher, I can, at the end of the day, measure the fruit of my work. We are engaged uh, not merely in the continuing attempt to crystallize our goals, but to reanimate our enthusiasm for the pursuit of them. In two days, we have heard illustrious performances by the Knights Templar of our amorphous but not disfigured movement and the blood stirs and the rush uh, reminds us of the intoxicating joys of liberty in a country of our own making and of our fathers and mothers making uh, in which we revere our freedom <coughs> and labor for our goals, yes, with democratic punctilio, but bearing also, hearing also the drumbeat of excitement that reminds us strand insistently that we were born free and urge us on in our determination to die freer yet so help us God.
thank you very, very much, Bill. And, and uh, I suspect you've now outlined enough to have an entire separate conference just on uh, the way in which you formulated the challenge in terms of conservatism and the nature of society. The, this is a, a uh, wonderful, that this, you don't always get the piece de resistance at the right moment, but I think hearing now from Lady Thatcher, let me just say two quick things. First, she's always direct even when it's not always cheering. I happened to see her in December, and she walked over to me and she said, now don't get your hopes up, it's only been two years, and it took three full years before I began to turn things around. Uh, I thought about that often over the following seven or eight months, and she certainly so far has been correct, but I have great hopes for next year. Uh, but it was typical of her to tell me what she thought I needed to hear rather than necessarily what I wanted to hear. But the other point I just wanted to make to all of us to remember as she comes to the podium. The conservative party that chose her as the leader in opposition was a party which I am confident had no idea the scale of choice it had made in the direction it would go. The British nation which chose her to be its leader, I am confident had little idea of the scale of cultural change and entrepreneurial activity she would undertake. In all of the elite wisdoms of the West would never have taken the choice she did over the Falklands on her own because of her belief in principle. There are few people you will ever in your life be able to be in a room with who in their own life personify the courage, the commitment to principle, and the willingness to stand fast that has been the hallmark of Lady Thatcher's entire career, and it is a great honor to ask her to come and address us. Mr. Speaker, and all other friends, may I thank you for your generous remarks and for coming here and wish you well when the time does come for the elections. I know that it's not far. I really find it very difficult to hear myself referred to as an ism. <laughs> As so many really bad isms have blasted their way through this century, the Nazism, the fascism, the communism, I think Ronald Reagan and I thought it time we invented a couple of good isms <laughs> to face the next century. <laughs> now there's something odd, as well as something stimulating, about the discussions we've had at this International Conservative Congress. And since there's no doubt about the stimulation, I shall immediately reflect upon the oddness. It lies in this. In the past, wherever and whenever conservative true believers used to come together, the refrain was always the same. It was that we had office without power, or differently put, power without influence. Though the faces changed when we won elections, the policies didn't. Still more bluntly put, it was that while conservative politicians were quite happy to be in office, they were very much less happy to implement a conservative agenda. In fact, if anything, the so-called ratchet effect as my old friend Keith Joseph christened it, meant that our countries proceeded fairly steadily in a left-wing direction. Come the 1980s, we changed all that. We fought not just for power, we fought for our true beliefs, and we were really quite successful. 
We were successful at home, transforming our economies and liberating the energy of our people. We were successful abroad, bringing to bear the full force of freedom against the socialism which had pledged to bury it. And we know the result, even if others are now studiously determined to forget or even deny that it was the result, namely that the communist prison house of nations collapsed in a grubby, ruinous chaos that the world is still trying to clear up. So great have been those changes that even our political opponents have had to recognize them, sometimes cynically, and let's be gracious about this, sometimes sincerely, as many on the left acknowledge the errors of their ways. To quote the Dean of American Marxist Historians, writing in 1990, less than 75 years after it officially began, he said, the contest between capitalism and socialism is over. Capitalism has won. Well, what more is there to say? Well, quite a lot, actually, because conservatism is about more than capitalism. I leave the judgment about American politics to others, though you'll not be surprised that I have my own opinions on the subject of President Clinton's administration. <laughs> but certainly in Britain, Tony Blair shifted the Labour Party so far to the right that at the last election, there appeared little to distinguish Labour from the Tories. Presented with a choice of two apparent conservative parties, the British people chose the newer one with a nicer face and better script, and with such a distant record as to inspire the hope that for once rehabilitation had worked. <laughs> and it has to be said that in Britain in 1997, just as earlier in America in 1991, one of Thatcher's laws came into play. Conservative governments which increase taxation lose elections. <laughs> it wasn't so much that the policies were wrong. In fact, some were rather good. It was that there was a quite deliberate positioning of the right of center governments towards the center rather than to the right in pursuit of a media-led consensus. You may gather I don't like consensus. <laughs> it's the negation of merit, it's the negation of belief. And I'm tempted at this point to suggest another law, namely, that the media class in general will always gravitate to the left because it needs big government to legitimate its all-intrusive power. Yet there still is an enormous difference between now and the position conservatives were in during the 1970s. For in the 1980s, we moved the world once and for all in our direction. The old arguments of the left have been discredited. Collectivist economics is seen as a dead end. The terrible threat posed to the West by communism in the form of the evil empire is a thing of the past. And this is what is odd. But we conservatives now find ourselves in precisely the opposite position to that we were in for most of the post-war period. Our ideas have been successful, but our parties recently have not. That's true of conservative parties almost everywhere. My own conservative party suffered a severe defeat in the last general election. Here the Republican Party again lost the presidency, and the Republicans still thankfully control both the Senate and the House. They seem to a friendly foreigner sometimes to be more afflicted with self-doubt than circumstances warrant. <laughs> but 
But I must qualify this reflection in an important way which forms a starting point for my argument today. For while we have converted our opponents to quite a large extent as regard economics, we have not done so on anything much else. And as conservatives above all should never forget, there is more to politics than economics. Indeed, if government is small enough, the infinite inventiveness of human talent will see to it that in general, the economics take care of themselves. The old truth still holds. There is much harm and only modest good that governments can do to promote a successful economy. And the more sophisticated the global economy becomes, the truer that will be. So if conservatism is not ultimately about economics, what is it about? The defense of the West. This in one short, simple phrase is as near as I can come to expressing the overall mission of conservatives now. That defense involves securing our nations against internal and external threats alike. I shall enlarge on those threats in a minute. But what are the core convictions we are defending? Not having time to pen a treatise, or even speak as long as a German politician, <laughs> I shall set out my views with English brevity. We conservatives believe that, a man has, that man has a basic sense of right and wrong, and an amazing creativity when free to apply his talents. But we also believe that his nature is flawed, such that without restraints applied by convention and law, he will destroy himself and others. We believe in free, limited democratic government as the framework most likely to minimize opportunities for mischief and abuse of power. But we scorn the association of vox populi with vox dei knowing that no mere majority vote can make what is good bad, or what is bad good. <laughs> and we recognize, like the authors of the Federalist Papers, that what they called Republican government, and what I would call true democratic government, can only work with a nation founded on religious and moral values, best expressed <laughs> best expressed, I believe, in Madison's Federalist Paper, number 55. We understand that in some areas, government has to be strong. It has to be prepared to use force to defend the nation's security. We appreciate the majesty and rituals and pomp of the state operating in its proper sphere. But we also believe that what is public ultimately exists for what is private. That it is the family, not the state or nation or even the church, which is the basic institution of our society without which all the rest collapses. We are suspicious at attempts of institutional change unless those institutions have become in their present form a threat to the whole future of our country, as the trade unions and the nationalized industries were, for instance, in Britain when I became prime minister. We view the world in which we live as in need, not of reordering according to master plans devised by enlightened experts, but rather of constant renewal according to timeless truths and rich traditions. And so we are unashamedly patriots. For as Edmund Burke wrote 200 years ago, and as David Willits quoted earlier today, to be attached to the subdivision, to love the little platoon to which we belong in society, is the first principle of public affection. It is the first link in the series by which we proceed towards the love of our country and to mankind. So here we stand, rock solid, rooted in a clear, tried, 
tested view of the world and the heavens and everything in them. These reflections immediately demonstrate, of course, one temptation to be avoided at all costs, not least because it is, in fact, the oldest temptation that conservative parties face. That is the desire to be what we are not in search of expressions of approval from those who are our sworn ideological adversaries while showing a reluctance to listen to our proven friends. Nothing would be more foolish than for conservatives to seek refuge in aping our opponents' policies, rhetoric, or heaven forbid, even identity. After all, if people really want social democracy, they won't be voting for us conservatives in any case. It can, of course, happen that some political sea change occurs against which no party can stand. This means that it has to adapt. But generally and politically in the modern age of mass politics, it is essential to be distinctive. Adaptation for a conservative party does not, therefore, mean becoming less conservative. It does not necessarily mean becoming more conservative, though it often may. It means expressing one's fundamental conservatism in different ways. And I thought Steve Forbes did it wonderfully well this morning. From this, it also follows that it would be absurd to deviate from the conservative fixed points which are now accepted in theory, if not always fully in practice, even by our opponents. Let me remind you of some of these. We must have small government in which as many functions as possible are carried out by the private, not the public sector. We must insist that the state concentrate on its core tasks, upholding law and order at home, maintaining a sound currency, and defending the nation's interests abroad. We must question remorselessly the measure, manner, and method of the government's involvement in the provision of health and education and social benefits because there is no eternally valid ordinance that private enterprise shall in these areas go thus far and no further. We must constantly remind ourselves and others of the creative potential of markets, not least the markets opened up by international free trade. And we must be alert to the dangers of over-regulation and creeping control, which many number of fashionable and politically correct agendas demand, and which any variety of power-hungry politicians will eagerly supply. All this is necessary, but equally, all this is not enough. Not enough to bring conservatives back to power, and still more important, not enough to respond to the fundamental challenges faced by the West. If I were to sum up the international conservative position today, I would say it was sound but unimaginative. It is sound because there is no need for a fundamental rethinking of basic principles as had to happen in the 1970s. It is unimaginative because conservatives have been slow and timid in applying those principles to new challenges. Then the time left to me, I can do no more than list five of these internal and external challenges and threats and sketch out a conservative response to them. The first threat, I believe, is to our traditional institutions of government, in other words, to the Constitution. In the United States, conservatives are concerned about the judicial imperialism of the Supreme Court and the sweeping social and economic changes it has imposed on the country. I believe you are right to be so, as has been eloquently explained elsewhere. The framework within which this controversy takes place is different from that in Britain, but the issues have a familiar and ominous ring. In the United Kingdom, we see something perhaps still more far-reaching, an attack by different forces on the foundations of our Constitution. 
These foundations are under attack on all sides. For some people, this is more part of a calculated program. And third, the future of the union with Scotland is now in the balance as a result of the strange which creating a Scottish Parliament will generate. And on this matter, those who think that the consequences are both limited and predictable may be in for a shock. And fourth, the union with Northern Ireland is also under attack by increasingly self-confident Republicans who have never disowned or abandoned the men of violence. Bringing Sinn Féin, the political wing of the IRA, into talks on the future of Northern Ireland, when the IRA themselves still retain their arms and refuse to disarm, shows how serious the British government is in its search for peace. But it surely represents the last concession that prudence would commend. Even now we should understand that this approach risks weakening the position of Ulster's constitutional politicians, unionist and nationalist alike. And last but not least, under this undermining the constitutional head, day in and day out, power and influence continue to be drained away from the House of Commons by the working of European institutions from Brussels to the benefit of an embryo European superstate. Frequently, they can pass regulations which we object to, and the European Court of Justice will decide that those regulations overrule our courts. We are therefore being governed by regulations to which we object, which our own courts cannot uphold, and which we are absolutely against when we voted in Brussels. Now, this is a very dangerous development because it means our representatives of the people in Parliament are being ruled by bureaucracy and a very, very, very ordinary Parliament in Brussels uh, with very, very limited powers. Now, these are dangerous developments. They're even more sinister taken together than they are taken separately. In resisting them, we Conservatives have to go back to the very heart of our Toryism, to our belief in tradition, in legitimate authority, in not tinkering with what works. America has a written constitution, the United Kingdom an unwritten one. But in both cases, they are rooted in history and enshrined by practice. A constitution is not something you change on a whim. We don't wish to go the way of that famous punch cartoon of the last century, which depicts an Englishman entering a public library and asking the librarian for a copy of the French Constitution. To be given the reply, sorry, sir, we don't stock periodicals. <laughs> <laughs> now, the second threat we face is to our national identity. I believe there's an echo here in the United States. We both have a threat to our national identity. Here in America, I have followed the controversy about immigration and ethnicity, which has preoccupied many, and which has even divided some in the conservative camp. In Britain, we too know the consequences of mass immigration in past years. In both our countries, we must recognize the priceless asset of a common language which forges unity out of the multi-ethnic variety and so makes democratic debate possible. The more so because the English language is soaked in the values of liberty. The main challenges to our British identity, however, are directly related to our powers of self-government, now under attack, as I have indicated, from European federalism. The current preoccupation in European capitals with a proposed single currency and its appalling implications for participants and non-participants alike should not for a moment distract our attention from the fact that this is and always has been not an economic 
but a political project. I may say, let me make it clear, I would have nothing to do with a single currency. It means we are no longer in control of our own destiny. Thank you. But nor is this matter of a single currency uh, of an administrative or institutional politics only. It's about deliberately fashioning a new sovereign political unit with a new artificially created supranational identity. The fact that this has never been proposed in such terms to the British people is only one example of the catalogue of deceit that has accompanied this venture. It is a source of sadness to some of us that still so few American conservatives have grasped both the inherently objectionable nature of what is intended and its implications for America's role as the single global superpower and ultimate guarantor of the West security. The irony is, of course, that while America and Britain have ever more apologetically to defend the right to our national identities against those who would subordinate them to the banality of the global village, almost everywhere else in the world, nationalism is on the rise. Now, nationalism is always a bit uncomfortable for other nations, often neighboring nations. It can be abused like other powerful emotions. But national pride offers people a genuine identity. It offers an anchor against the pull of bureaucratic internationalism, against that cultural globalization which conservatives rightly fear as opposed to economic globalization, which in my view they should not. We conservatives must applaud attachment to the values and institutions which unite us, and that means we should promote a sense of national identity. Now, I have already touched on the third threat I have in mind. That is a threat to our Western culture. Let me immediately say, we are right to be skeptical of some aspects of what is called cultural politics. The undermining of our traditional education systems, about which Newt Gringrich has spoken and also Bill Buckley, which has gone on longer in Britain, but which in the new age of political correctness seems to have gone in overdrive here, is now a very grave danger. It threatens the collective memory of our society from which its habits and even its identity flow. In some ways, I think we are the first generation to have unlearned history. Unless you learn it, you are condemned to repeat its mistakes. When a Stanford University English professor describes Milton as, and I quote, an ass, a sexist pig, and when Shakespeare is only on the syllabus of Duke University, in the words of another professor, to illuminate the way 17th century society mistreated women, the working class and minorities, I think we can say that university education in some universities is effectively coming to an end. <laughs> We should be warned, a society only needs one generation to abandon the task of learning and transmitting its culture for that culture to become an alien, lifeless irrelevance. A powerful radical left-wing clerisy is bent on destroying what every past generation would have understood to be the central purpose of education. That is allowing, again the words of Edmund Burke, allowing individuals to avail themselves of the general bank and capital of nations and of ages. No amount of fiddling with structures will alter what is happening, only by ensuring that we have the right teachers with the right training and the right ideas will we stop the rot. Otherwise, the cultural revolutionaries with their jarring cacophony, will drown out forever 
what Lincoln called the mystic chords of memory. The fourth threat to the West is very closely linked to educational failure. It is, as other speakers have mentioned, the attack on the traditional family. Of course, the family has also been attacked in unsystematic ways in both our countries and under parties of both left and right. The effectively unconditional supply of social benefits to those who were thought incapable of coping undermined the incentive to work and provided an alternative and seemingly endless income from government. It thus undercut the family unit. It promoted habits of idleness and delinquency. It permitted single parenthood to become a financially sustainable alternative way of life. And in both your country and in mine, 31% of the births this year are illegitimate. By undermining the self-respect of so many of the most vulnerable members of society, the respectable poor struggling for decency against the odds, the dependency culture poisoned and weakened society as a whole. And on top of all that, there has been a full-scale and deliberate assault on the institution of the family itself. The exaltation of violent and explicit sex increasingly coarsens the content of films and books and eventually and inevitably life itself. This is not progress, it's not liberation, it's decadence. We conservatives are not most of us saints, but even as sinners, we have a duty to fight as wholeheartedly as our enemies promote the attack on the family that threatens the West at its foundations. And threat five to Western security, so much from the threats from within. But finally, let's not forget the threats from without. In meeting these, it makes no more sense to abandon traditional institutions and proven methods than it does in any of the other areas I have mentioned. Well, yes, there have been profound changes with the end of the Cold War. But equally, my friends, there's a still more profound continuity. For there is always a present danger. After all, no one can nowadays doubt the potential for death and damage of today's international terrorist. We ought similarly to have heard enough stories most recently from none other than General Labed, who ought to know about lost nuclear weapons and materials. We ought to fear the consequences of proliferation in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. The sight of Chinese troops moving into Hong Kong should have reminded us that in the Far East, communism is not yet vanquished. Indeed, that a sinister and so far successful experiment in combining economic freedom with political servitude confronts us in China. And we don't, do not yet know where it will lead. Strong defense supported by heavy investment on the latest technology, including ballistic missile defense, is as essential now when we don't know who our future enemy may be as it was in the Cold War year. And my friends, we must keep ahead technologically. We must not constrain the hands of our researchers. Had we done so in the past, we would never have had the military superiority which in the end with the dropping of the atomic weapon won the war in the Far East for us and saved many, many lives, even though it destroyed others. We must always keep technologically ahead. If not, we have no way in which to be certain that our armed forces could prevail. And the research and technology of the United States is sheer genius, and it always has been. We used to have, I see some people here, Senator Kyle, we used to have arguments about the anti-ballistic missile treaty. And we were constrained under that treaty from going ahead with new weaponry. 
we were not constrained with doing research. And we had argument after argument, because I said research is never complete until you've tested it to see if it works. So you can put a, uh, you put a missile up in the sky, an anti-ballistic missile, to see if it works. Uh, the Russians argued against. They were absolutely wrong, and I don't think we sustained our argument strongly enough. But I'm appalled if there might be another treaty which constrains our ability to do the research and the development and to go into production. Now, <laughs> we are absolutely right to preserve but widen NATO and right to resist Russian threats aimed at, aimed at us stopping from doing so. NATO must remain the basis for Western defense and no rival institution or alternative set of priorities be allowed to challenge that. But NATO, unless it is to become a mere institution for collective security, rather than an effective alliance, must be led. And only America, with the support of staunch allies, has the resources, the reach, and the reputation to lead it. I can't see that, that changing. And I'm fearful of any attempt to make it change, because such a change could threaten peace. Understanding and accepting this will always be easier for us in Britain than for our European neighbors. The Anglo-American relationship is not some outdated romantic notion. It reflects shared history, shared language, shared values, and shared ideals. The very things which generate that willingness for sacrifice on which the outcome of every military venture ultimately depends. Western cooperation will also be easier if we reassert, as I have been suggesting, the moral and cultural foundations of our Western world. In the Cold War years, we were able to persuade our populations that our values were worth fighting for. <coughs> By reiterating those values, we conservatives offer the best prospect of security, stability, and peace. And may I say that our whole program, policy, and success rested on fundamental beliefs and principles translated into policy and then into action. That is much better than those who've emulated us, who've not embraced our principles, They've merely taken our policies because they work. That's quite different from founding your policies on fundamental beliefs and principles. Because when the going... Because <laughs> when the going gets rough, and it does, if you're founded on belief and principles, you will stick to them. The whole of our program, like any political program in the real world, has to adapt to circumstances. But what gives it such relevance and weight today is that it is the only one which recognizes the overriding importance of keeping the West strong and united. Western civilization would not be the first to reshape others in its own image, only to discover that it had lost the identity, confidence, and will to survive. On this matter, the historians of the classical world could provide some useful lessons for today's Western liberal politicians. The decline of the West has been predicted before, and it has not occurred. It need not occur, and it will not occur if we conservatives keep faith in everything we have achieved and the beliefs and principles which inspired us to prevail. Thank you.
Lady Thatcher, Speaker Gingrich, Mr. Buckley, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Executive Committee of the Bourgeoisie, I hereby declare the first Congress of the Con Intern well and truly closed.